Hello, my name is Jacob, and I am a Norse pagan. And today, I want to talk about the Norse gods of spring while it's snowing. I actually went out earlier this week on a beautiful spring day. Warm sun, cool breeze, wind, flowers, birds, everything. And the problem was it was too nice of a spring day. The wind was loud, the sun got in everything, and basically all the footage was unusable. I will have a couple clips from there because a couple of them, like I gave an offering to Frere while out that still was preserved pretty well, so I will be showing that. Um, and so here I am now recording the Norse Gods of Spring video and it's snowing. So I don't know if that's like a sign from the gods or what, or it just shows that nature is incredibly unpredictable and that the Norse gods of spring are probably more complex than we give them credit for because yes, you have beauty. Yes, you have beautiful flowers and fertility and helicopters. I think the complexity of spring is no more evident than in the deities that are venerated during these times, or at least the most commonly venerated deities such as Freyr, Freya, Idun, Sunar, Sol, and Ostara, or Eostre, uh, which are all the deities I want to be talking about in today's video. A couple of notes before we actually begin this video. Unlike the previous Norse Gods of Winter video, I'm not going to be reading right from the Prosetta. I took a bunch of notes this time around because the reason for this is, is most of the deities on this list, I do plan on doing a deeper dive video on, particularly Freyr and Freya, who I plan on having an entire week covering. So in this video, I wanted to focus just on the main facts that give these gods their spring aspects or why people most commonly tie them to spring. Just like in my Norse Gods of Winter video, I did do a poll on YouTube asking what deity people primarily honor and venerate during springtime. You had Freya at 49% of the total votes, um, and then you have Freyr at 19%, and then Osara or Eostre came in very closely to Freyr at 18%, and then Idun and Suna or Sol came in at 7% each. So this was really quite surprising, and once again, when I did my research and looked into uh, the internet and saw, what did the internet say? What does, if you type in plainly, Norse God of Spring, who comes up? It actually surprised me quite a bit that Idun was actually the number one hit uh, when I searched Norse God of Spring. Uh, Freya did come in in a couple mentionings, but it was pretty much universally Idun. Since the gods are more personalities than true, honest symbols of certain things, we never really get that one god of something like you do in other pantheons. Uh, but let's go ahead and move forward and talk about our first deity of spring, and that is Freyr. There are not a lot of stories about Freyr within the Poetic Edda, um, and there are actually a decent amount written in the Prose Edda. The thing is, is that most of these stories do not actually give us any information or evidence to suggest that he was the god of spring. Um, within the Poetic Edda, there's basically nothing to suggest this. Gilfagening in the Prose Edda is actually the only place we see Freyr compared to the weather and to prosperity and to the fields. And of course, this all comes from Snorri Sturluson declaring this. And so, again, reading from the Poetic and the Prose Edda, there really isn't that much information to tie him to spring, besides this small excerpt from Snorri. So normally I would say, well, since Snorri wrote it, I don't know if I trust it. However, we do have another source that actually does state that Freyr is a god of prosperity, a god of the fields, and a god somewhat tied to the seasons. And that comes from Adam of Bremen in the 11th century, who talks about a first-hand account of a heathen temple that someone else saw that he read. Again, if it was just Adam of Bremen that said this, I would be a little skeptical. But now you have Adam of Bremen and Snorri Sturluson saying that Freyr's tied to prosperity, the seasons, and the change in weather. So I do take this a little bit more truthfully than I do some other accounts that are only listed in one place. These two accounts do give us a little bit more evidence to support that he is a god of spring, but compared to the majority of evidence we have about Freyr, which is mostly about his um, kingship, about his time as a ruler and his dynasty by Snorri, the other main story we have about Freyr is him obsessing over Gerther and giving up his sword in order to be with her, which eventually leads to his death at Ragnarok. All right, enough about Freyr and the changing seasons. It's, again, the seasons changed on me before my very eyes. Let's go talk about Freyr. Oh, 
Oh, Freya, there is so much we have to talk about, but that is why I am going to have an entire Freya's week coming up where I dive into the source material and everything we know. We have so many different individual sources on Freya and who she is and what she represents that it's going to take an entire week to go through it. But for this video, I'm focusing only on the aspects that tie her to spring. So when it comes to the Poetic and the Prose Edda, there's nothing concrete that says Freya is tied to spring as there really isn't about any of these deities, um, but it seems like that since she is tied to beauty, to femininity, to fertility, that these things have given her the aspects of spring that people look for. Um, and this is evident in the fact that even after the Christianization of Scandinavia, she was still hailed as a protector of the fields, as something the farmers looked towards and when it came to taking care of the crops um, and taking care of like the husbandry of the animals on their farm. Um, so it seems like she was still very honored even after Christianization. This is especially amazing considering the fact that she was incredibly demonized by the Christianization of the Nordic tales that we have, often la labeled as a harlot and a whore and very promiscuous. She is very demonized um, and a lot of her imagery was actually swapped with the Virgin Mary. So we still, even though we do have a lot of evidence about Freya, a lot of it has also probably been lost and or tainted. But her connection to spring and her connection to beauty and new life is still holding true. We also see this in the fact that in Scandinavia, Freya is still in the top 25 names for newborn baby girls. And so I think Freya's legacy has lived on as something that resembles beauty and femininity. And I think the spring season is tied to beauty and femininity. I mean, no more, I mean, this is just so gorgeous. Even though it is snowing right now, weirdly enough, um, it is absolutely gorgeous um, out here. And I think, I mean, out here right now, I'm smelling flowers, pollen, new life. It smells amazing. And it's just one of those things where it's just like, we don't have written evidence saying Freya is tied to spring, but since she's tied to beauty, I don't think it's possible to look at these flowers, look at these new blooms and not think of her. When I first started the research for this video, I actually didn't know that much about Ethan except her ties to the youth giving apples. And that's still about all I know about her. Uh, and it seems like that's where most of our connections to spring come from. So she is almost non-existent in the Poetic Edda. Um, she's listed in Locusena during the taunts of Loki to the Asgardians. Um, and she's there as a peacemaker and is trying to make, get everyone to make peace and siding with Bragi, her husband. But that's basically it in the Poetic Edda. Um, so in the Prose Edda, she does get a little bit more screen time, so to speak. Um, and mostly in the story of how um, she was stolen by Thiazi, who um, like snagged her up and put her in his nest. And that the gods of Asgard began to age when her absence was noticed and so they actually had to send Loki to go save her uh, using um, Freya's cape to turn into a bird and then he turned her, Ethun, into an acorn and snatched her up and flew back to Asgard. But in this story we get most of the mythos around her and her youth giving apples. Even though she is barely mentioned, I believe this um, connection to youth giving apples is enough to solidify her on the internet very clearly but also within our own personal practices of a, as a goddess of spring. And I think that's because apples are such a symbol of beauty and youth and sweetness and life. We also have to talk about the elf in the room and the fact that Eve in the Garden of Eden takes an apple and eats it. And so I don't know what came first, Eve or Ethan. But we can definitely see there's connections and I, I don't know if they've influenced one another, but there are a lot of connections there. And really we're looking at the apple. The apple, I mean, the, the saying an apple day keeps the doctor away, you know, things like that, you know, the apple is a sign of educations and teachers. Is it such a symbolic thing just for being a fruit that when we know that Ethan is tied to apples and fruit, it does, it's not a long jump to say that she's tied to a new beginning, to beauty, to softness, to the beauty of nature. So whereas I think sometimes Freya definitely embodies sometimes the more violent, predatorial things like falcons and hawks and cats and things like that and honeybees that, you know, have a beauty and a danger to them, I feel like Ethan definitely represents the pure beauty and youthfulness and innocence of spring.
I was so glad the sun finally decided to show up to warm up this incredibly cold spring day, uh, but also to show up for me to talk about Suna and Soul, and the fact that we know almost nothing. Uh, if you haven't noticed a theme in this video is we started with what we know the most about, and we've trickled down to what we know so little about. In particular in the Poetic Edda, it's barely mentioned as a creation, it just says the sun was basically created as a companion to the moon. That's basically it. The pro is that we're only given a little bit more information and I don't know how much it actually helps us because it just says that the sun and the moon are carried on a chariot, um, you know, of horses and they're being chased by wolves. We're also given a, a father's name of Mundelfari, a Mundelfari, but then when I looked up Mundelfari, we know almost nothing about him. So moral of the story is we know Nothing in this book, nothing in any of the books we have, really are going to help us on the ancient traditions of sun worship or sun veneration in the pre-Christian Scandinavian times. But we know that the majority of pagan cultures, the majority of earth and bone religions, venerate the sun in some way. And it seems like this is also a thought among many scholars. And any research I did do, it seems like people are like, yes, the sun was most likely venerated by the Scandinavian Viking people. We just don't know how. And that's kind of where we are here. The sun is the life-giving force of this planet. It dictates what our temperature is. It dictates our life. It dictates so much of these things. If there's one, it's a giant ball of energy that just is warm right now and is blinding me. Like we can't look at it because it's so powerful. So yes, the sun is important. It's just sadly within the Norse mythos and the understandings of pre-Christian Scandinavian and Germanic culture, we just don't know that much about it. So I believe the sun, yes, should be hailed and should be venerated, and you can call it a sunnah, call it a soul. We just don't know how to do that in a way that honors the ancestors as well. As we close in on our last deity of spring, I think it's time to have a slight honest conversation about what the wisdom of Odin is. So I am not an academic. I have a degree in art studio with a focus on painting and a minor in art history. I'm not a scholar. I haven't written a book yet. I might write a book eventually, but you know, at the end of the day, I'm just a YouTuber. I'm a guy that started a channel because he was struggling with his faith. So he wanted to make videos to share with others who were also struggling. Um, and all the content I make is all things I've wondered along the way. So when it became springtime, of course, I was like, I want to know more about the gods of spring. So I started doing research, compiling it, and now sharing it with you. I am simply sharing my journey. And this is a long way of telling you that I am not a linguist, and I hate linguistics, and I just don't care. It seems like the majority of the information we have on Ostara or Aostre comes from Jacob Grimm, one of the authors of Grimm's Fairy Tales. Um, and when looking into him, uh, besides the fact that he wrote Grimm's Fairy Tales, he also was trying to write an entire like index on the German language. Um, and I believe he got 33 volumes in before he passed away, or before he gave up, and I think he wanted to write over 100 so this is a very boring man in my standards in the sense that I don't really like linguistics enough to write 33 volumes, let alone read a few pages of them. But again, this is why I'm saying I'm not an academic, I'm not a linguist, I'm just a guy trying to figure out this faith like the rest of you. And it seems like... I've been able to deduce from my research and my time looking into uh, Ostara and Aostre is that she is a goddess of spring tied to a specific holiday that was venerated in the pre-Christian Scandinavian Germanic and Anglo-Saxon time. Mostly Anglo-Saxon and Germanic. Um, and that some of our modern Eastern traditions may stem from her in some way. And again, when I say this, it seems like these are theories that it's like, well, we do this in Easter, this was the original tradition, so maybe there's some original things there. So things like the Easter bunny, um, you know, things like, uh, you know, painting eggs, may be tied to Ostara or Aostre. We just simply don't know. We can't confirm or deny it. Um, but again, we are kind of left with the fact that if there is a spring goddess, it seems like it is Ostara. So what do we do with this information? Should Ostara be venerated during the springtime? It seems like it. And even in like our spring gathering video, we called it Ostara. Can we call our spring gatherings Ostara? Is that something that seems fitting? Yes, it seems like that the pre-Christian Anglo-Saxon and Germanic peoples did have a celebration around Ostara uh, during the springtime. So I think we can call our spring celebrations Ostara. It seems like it's something that connects us to something deeper. 
and that's really one of the only ways we know how to venerate Ostara as a goddess. Um, but I think if we look at Easter, we look at modern Eastern celebrations and take things like, you know, uh, the Easter bunny eggs and start bringing those a little bit more into an old world context, we might find what Ostara is and who she is. That is the end of the informational segment of this video. I have one last thing to share with you. Um, it is something I filmed previously on the day I came out here and it was way too windy. Um, and you know, it's also way too windy today too. So hopefully I've been able to cut a lot of the wind. I apologize that there is some, but it is just, it, I mean, I'm warm now and it snowed when I first started filming this. So I don't even know, spring is crazy, spring is beautiful. But I did film an offering on the original day I came out here. So I'm going to share that with you because it is really cool and it ties into a little special video I did for Wednesday. Um, um, so I hope you stick around to check that out. Otherwise, thank you so very much for watching this video. I hope it's been informative to you, and I hope it's um, informed you on how to give to the Norse gods of spring. Um, and until the haul, skull. Hold up. I just found this, a trail here on Lexington. I did not make this. Someone else clearly has made this. I don't think it was made for a pagan intention, but you know what? I'm gonna invoke some Vikingness here, and I hereby declare this a pagan thing now because this is a pagan thing. You can't hide that from me. Even if you made this and you are a devout Christian, you have made something that is pagan. And so therefore, I'm declaring it for pagans. And I'm declaring it for spring, and I'm declaring it for Freyr. And yeah, I mark my territory. Does anyone want to challenge me on that? Nope. No one challenging me on that? Great, this is a pagan shrine now, and I'm gonna come back here a lot as long as it exists. Oh, I am really excited because I don't know who did this. Oh, that might have looked kind of sketchy, but I'm gonna give this apple to it. You are Freyr now, and you are representing Freyr. And I am really excited, and I hope this stays around forever. And I hope other pagans, this is at the Arboretum in Lexington, deep into the trail. And I hope you find it, because I want more offerings to be given here. So, to you Freyr, God of prosperity and spring, I give to you this apple in celebration of this monument that someone has graciously, graciously made for us. I'm literally shaking because this is awesome. Um, so yeah, I give this apple to, you. to spring to the old gods. Hail the beauty of this world and the prosperity of this world, and may many people come here and venerate you because this is awesome. <laughs>